Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a model of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Our host and moderator for Global Connections is Robert Siegel, former host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio for 31 years. Over the course of an hour each month, Global Connections features guests who Robert Siegel interviews as they explore important issues in our world. Today's Global Connections topic is Year of the Vaccine. Thank you to our very special guests, Dr. Erwin Redlener, Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Ofer Levy, Dr. Jason Swartz, and Dr. Michael Drescher from Israel's Rabin Medical Center. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Uh, if 2020 was the year of the virus, uh, then 2021 is, we hope, the year of the vaccine. And between the pandemic and the campaign to defeat its spread, there is great asymmetry. Uh, the virus is a submicroscopic scrap of nucleic acid coated with protein. Some scientists call viruses organisms at the edge of life. Uh, they're driven to reproduce, but to do so, they must invade the cells of host organisms like us. By way of contrast, a vaccine is anything but elemental. Vaccination summons the skills of civilization itself, science, industry, commerce, government, social organization, mutual trust. And that's the challenge in this year of the vaccine, to harness the efforts and talents of individuals and institutions to stamp out the spread of this contagion. Can we do it effectively and efficiently and equitably enough to save lives and deliver us from what we call here this new abnormal? We'll be hearing a remarkable panel address those very questions. Uh, and our first guest who joins us from New York is Dr. Erwin Redliner. Uh, Dr. Redliner is a pediatrician by training. He is director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Dr. Erwin Redliner, welcome to our presentation. And uh, I, I want to first hear your appraisal of where we stand right now. Uh, both Pfizer and Moderna developed uh, vaccines very rapidly, but we appear to be sputtering on the distribution and delivery end. Is that a fair, fair appraisal? Yes, Robert. I actually think it's a very fair appraisal. And I think there were certain expectations, including 20 million people getting their first dose, dose of vaccine by the end of December, which uh, didn't happen. And a lot of factors uh, that go into that, including the capabilities of Moderna and Pfizer and other manufacturers eventually to get up to speed, to get the doses uh, in the quantity that we need. But there are many, many more barriers and uh, problems along the way here, including the distribution of the vaccine. And one of them, the Pfizer uh, vaccine needs to be at extraordinarily low temperatures. And that's uh, one challenge that has to be dealt with. The second thing is that there are something on the order of 65 to 70 million Americans who live in what's called health professional shortage areas, that's a federal designation, where they have trouble accessing medical care in the first place. So now we're layering on, layering on a very uh, aspirationally rapid uh, desire to get everybody vaccinated. It's going, to be, it's going to be tough. There's also been confusion about the priority categories that the CDC put forward. And 
some flexibility there, but I still think at least in New York and other states, there's a lot of confusion about how to go from one category and when to do so from one category to the next. So there's lots of problems. And of course, uh, and uh, Peter Hotez will sure speak about this, but we're looking at vaccines that have somewhere in the range of 90 to 94% or so effectiveness, which is, which is great. It's phenomenal, except that if you're vaccinating 100 million people, that means that about 10 million people won't get the desired immune response. So we have lots and lots of problems. This is by no means over. The, you know, I know you call it the year of the vaccine. It's still the year of a raging out of control pandemic that shows no particular sign of letting up. There's a lot of reasons that we can go into for that. And fortunately, we have a new team that's actually may bring capability and expertise uh, to the table, something that was sorely missing uh, during these last months when this whole situation was under the quote unquote control of uh, President Trump and his administration. Many, many missteps, Robert. Some obvious consequences of, of falling behind uh, schedule on vaccinations are a failure to slow the rate of infection, obviously, and then consequently a failure for the economy to get to get moving uh, again. Are there further consequences? That is, is there a use it or lose it problem that if we can't deliver the vaccines, the, the supplies might diminish? Well, there's all sorts of issues about the longevity. You know, once you once you defrost. Uh, bottle of vaccine, uh, you know, you have to use it within a certain number of hours or it goes bad. But I I think the bigger question is what you just alluded to, which is that um, you, the, the, a pandemic of this nature, this lethality, uh, is a very, very dangerous and disruptive reality for society. And it affects deeply the economy. It affects people's mental health. It, it is uh, really driving people nuts that, that we've been so long uh, and doing these public health measures of separations, avoiding large groups, uh, uh, mass, and so on. And that has a, a grinding effect on people, in addition to the fact that we have eight or nine million more people in poverty since this began. So this is there's no way of disentangling these various issues. You, it's not like a, an option that I think we'll just focus on the vaccine. We can't. Mm -hmm. We have to simultaneously focus on the vaccine uh, and the and the pandemic. You, you wrote a book back in 2006 called Americans at Risk, Why We Are Not Prepared for Mega Disasters and What We Can Do Now. And you, you described the possibility in that book of a, of a terrible avian flu, uh, of uh, avian flu pandemic. But you weren't just writing about pandemics. You're writing uh, your experience of, of what happened in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was, was, was a big influence on you. And uh, you, you would say there's something about it, our country that uh, either encourages unpreparedness or at least makes us not rebel at the thought of unpreparedness for disaster. What is it? Well, I, I, there's something about the American DNA uh, from a sociological point of view. You know, we're pretty good, although not great, at responding to a, a catastrophe. Preparing for and preventing is not our strong suit, let me put it that way. Uh, we have some inherent problem in getting our arms wrapped around what you have to do to prevent future calamities, even though we know they're coming. You know, the climate change uh, is and the uh, and global warming is a tremendous disaster. We see it's right in front of us. The train wreck is about to happen. And we're just, we can't get our arms around it. And I think the same goes, yeah, it was like, you know, 14 years ago or so that that, uh, that book came out and I laid out a scenario for how the pandemic would unfold. There was discussions about how to deal with this back in the earlier in the 2000s, but, you know, and I wasn't the only one, plenty of people were yeah. worried about that. And it's just that uh, we just didn't do anything about it. And then it got here and we're incredibly not prepared. Uh, you, by the way, when you wrote about the idea of, of an avian flu pandemic, you were very concerned about children. Are you, are you surprised that we're not talking about uh, uh, a pandemic among small children this year? Well, especially as a pediatrician as, and as a grandfather of seven, I should add, I'm very concerned about it. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, the children being affected by uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, represent a relatively small percentage of the total population. Children are not getting as sick, although there's been plenty of fatalities and hospitalizations of children. There were some odd syndromes that we've been seeing over the last several months. Uh, the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children has, you know, it's it's a real thing. But 
On the other hand, we don't see children transmitting the virus yet as rapidly as adults or let's say teenagers. Although, and again, hopefully uh, Peter will address this, the, the reality of these new strains that we've been reading about have a much greater proclivity for uh, transmissibility and communicability and also affecting children more. But I don't think we have enough data yet to say exactly how we're gonna quantify that, in, that new risk to children that I think coming down is coming down the pike right now. Well, Dr. Redliner, please please stay with us because the Q&A is coming up later, but thanks for your, uh, for your comments uh, so far. Uh, the expertise of Dr. Peter Hotez uh, and the issues that we're talking about is multidimensional. Uh, Dr. Hotez is a professor of pediatric and molecular virology and dean of the School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor University. He's in Houston. Uh, he has spent years studying and developing vaccines for neglected diseases. In fact, uh, Baylor is developing a COVID uh, vaccine together with a pharmaceutical company in India. He has also been a leader in rebutting the arguments of anti-vaxxers, people who advocate a variety of anti-scientific arguments against vaccines. Uh, and as the parent of a daughter with autism, he wrote a very interesting and moving book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. Uh, Dr. Peter Hotez, welcome uh, to, our, to our panel. Thanks so much. Uh, Great to be here. Uh, first, your, uh, in, in brief, your appraisal of where we stand today in the campaign to get vaccines to, to the American people. Um, we get a failing grade so far, and we're going to have to fix it. You know, what happened in the U.S. in 2020 was we, we failed almost in every aspect of COVID-19 control. We never launched a national program. We missed the entry of the virus from Europe into New York in the last when it came in at the end of January last year, around this time, we missed the ability to to implement diagnostic testing. We never really got virus genomic sequencing off the ground. We failed to halt the southern surge over the summer and this fall surge. And so we're now our backs into a corner and all we have left now, more or less, is to vaccinate our way out of it. And we all thought that there was a plan in place. And now in this new year, we're realizing there is no plan. And that's where we have to start. Um, we've now got a daunting task of vaccinating what I estimate to be 240 million Americans. That's three quarters of the U.S. population. And that's what our estimates with a group at City University of New York finds that we need to interrupt virus transmission. So you do the back of the envelope calculations. That's especially if you have two dose vaccines, that's 2 million Americans every day from now until uh, the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. And we're not close to that. So this is not an option. This is our last arrow that we have. And so we've got to fix it. How concerned should we be about uh, news of new strains of the virus uh, turning up? That is, are they, are they changing so rapidly that the uh, vaccines we're developing uh, become out of date or become like flu shots that we have to, uh, that, are, that are changed each year uh, in anticipation of what's coming? I, I don't think so. I don't think the the, you know, the genome of coronaviruses and we've been working on coronaviruses and coronavirus vaccines for the last decade. It's the genome is not as plastic as it say is influenza, which undergoes whole antigenic shifts uh, uh, and variation every year. But the the new variants are concerning, and we're watching them very closely. We're doing studies now with our vaccine, as our other groups, to confirm that the immune response to the vaccines will still cross neutralize the UK variant, the South African variant. But I li what I like to point out is there may be homegrown variants in the US that we're not even picking up because we've only done 50,000 virus genomes. We should be at 10 million by now. And, and so we've you know come up small yet again, whereas Australia sequenced uh, half of the, the virus isolates, the UK 10%, we've done 0.3%. So, so, so you're saying that- to fix. That you're saying that we're aware of the new UK strain because in the UK they're looking for new strains. They're they're they're, they're they, they take that seriously. That's right, and they they noticed that it was out competing the other virus lineages in southeastern England over in Kent and into London, and and we have it here as well. And it's just that we don't know the extent of it, and we don't know if there are similar homegrown variants in the U.S. that may be doing the same thing. So that's going to be a priority of the new administration to put in. You know, we've got the world's 
uh, highest genome sequencing capacity in the world between places like the Broad Institute at Harvard, MIT, and the New York Genome Center, and University of Washington, and Washington University in St. Louis, and Baylor. We just haven't harnessed it, and now yeah. we've got to do that. Uh, I mentioned that you've spent years rebutting the anti-vaxxers. Uh, how serious a problem is resistance to the idea of a vaccine among Americans, or are we so so far behind schedule right now that we haven't bumped into that problem yet? No, it's it's here, and we saw it coming. You know, we have a very aggressive anti-vaccine movement. It has comes in different flavors. To give you an example, we just did a survey in collaboration with a group of social scientists at Texas A and M University. And they came, we came up with almost identical findings to an earlier study put up by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And the two groups most vaccine hesitant um, are quite interesting um, just because they're so different. One is uh, one called what we call Trump voters and, and what um, the Kaiser Family Foundation called Republicans and the others, the African-American communities. Yeah. So, you know, you look at those two and you say, what do they have in common? Well, the, 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 on the, the Trump voter story is, there was a shift in the anti-vaccine movement in 2015 under this uh, banner of medical freedom, health freedom, freedom that glommed on issues related to the political extremism on the far right. And, um, and that now has added on protests against uh, contact tracing and social distancing and masks. And that's one of the reasons we've had such a terrible time with this uh, epidemic. And now that part, that far right extremist part has now expanded into Western Europe and there's been protests now in uh, Paris and London and linked to QAnon and, uh, and I have to say a component of anti-Semitism to that as well, that there's been links to neo-Nazi groups and, you know, they're, they're going after a lot of Jewish scientists and it's, it's, that really concerns me. And from the African American community, it's a very different set of dynamics. The African American community—it's—it's it's often uh, linked back to the uh, experience of the of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments or other other uh, very uh, other pieces of racist medicine, frankly, in the United States. Or do yeah, you? Although, do, do you although, although I would although I would add also the other piece to this is if you remember uh, the awful measles epidemic among the Orthodox Jewish communities in New York uh, in 2018, 2019. And there we saw those same anti-vaccine groups specifically targeting the Orthodox Jewish community and using very inflammatory language, comparing vaccines to the Holocaust and passing out, you know, fake yellow Jewish stars that had the words vaxxed written like they look like Hebrew lettering. I mean, it's, it's as, as offensive as you could possibly imagine. And then they began uh, hosting what they called the Harlem Vaccine Forum rallies in, in, uh, in 2019. So there's deliberately tar deliberate targeting of, of specific groups that is not a lot of people talk about, but alarms me quite a bit. So one other, one other point I wanted to ask you about, which is your work on the vaccine uh, in India. Uh, I guess it should remind us that obviously vaccination is going to be a different project in an enormous uh, poor country uh, than it'll be in the United States. Uh, and uh, is is your vaccine um, targeted at, uh, at 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 its its Indian population? Say. Well, you know, as Dr. Redliner pointed out, you know, we're, we're worried about the two mRNA vaccines and whether they have capacity to really scale up. And that's a particular, and as tough as things are in the U.S., it's even worse in the world's low and middle income countries. Yeah. Those RNA vaccines are not going to filter to those countries. So what do you do? And so we've been developing low cost uh, global health vaccines for the last 20 years. And uh, now, and we started a coronavirus program 10 years ago, and now we have a low cost recombinant protein vaccine being scaled up to 1.2 billion uh, doses so we with, with a with a one of the big Indian pharmaceutical companies known as biological e and that's very exciting we've never made a billion of anything before yeah. and so that's being tested across India you, you and, know uh, yet what percent protection it would, it, it would we, we don't know it's in, it gives great protection on human primates it's in going into phase two trials now. So hopefully we'll know that soon. We'd also like to bring it into the U.S. if we couldn't find the right investor that wants to bring it to the U.S., especially as a pediatric vaccine, because it's the same technology used for the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine that's been given to kids for 40 years. So maybe we'll find some uh, help there as well. Well, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Peter Hotez of Baylor University, thank you very much. And please stick around for the Q&A in, in a few minutes. It's good talking with you. 
Uh, our next guest is a regular on these Global Connections Guides to Navigating the New Abnormal. Uh, Dr. Michael Drescher runs the emergency department at Rabin Medical Center in the greater Tel Aviv area. Uh, over the past several months, uh, we've heard about the waves of the virus there, about challenges faced in getting Israelis to accept social distancing measures, uh, and also about the hospital's expansion of its uh, facilities to handle spikes in COVID cases. Uh, at this stage, uh, Dr. Drescher, we have some good news to hear from Petah Tikva, Israel. Uh, was recently cited as the country with the highest percent of its people vaccinated. Uh, is, is the country still holding up uh, that, that first place in the standings? Well, good, good evening, uh, evening here, uh, Robert, from Israel. Um, yes, uh, as uh, you know, we just are about approaching 2 million uh, vaccinated, the first initial vaccinations uh, out of a population of nine million people, and so uh, and and of and that's even a better percentage given the fact that some of those are children who are not going to be uh, vaccinated this time. Uh, so yes, as far as I know, this is still this is the highest uh, percentage anywhere in the world. I just saw that the UAE, who we just had a, uh, a peace treaty with, uh, uh, coincidentally, ha is uh, also quite close, and everyone else is is really quite far behind that percentage. Well, since we seem to be going a lot slower than that here in the States, and you're familiar with both countries very well, uh, what's what's different in Israel? Why have they been more effective in vaccinating? Well, I think there's three three factors. One is that Israel's, first of all, Israel is a much smaller country, a much smaller target uh, population. Uh, but also, it is a more centralized uh, medical system, especially at the level of primary care. There's only five uh essentially HMOs, um, insurance companies that uh, insure the entire population. And there is a central uh, legal requirement that everyone uh, be covered by one of these companies. And, and they're very, uh, they're very good at tracking and knowing where their uh, insured patients are. So that was a platform that was easily adopted to uh, giving out infection. And, and this is something that's been done, that is done every year uh, for influenza and other uh, public health issues. So the, the infrastructure there was there. And then finally, uh, as was mentioned earlier by some of your, your guests, um, you know, the final logis the logistics of the final mile to, to the, to the, to the uh, a patient of these uh, vaccines is, is really not uh, a simple matter. And there's a very good logistic uh, setup in Israel for getting things from one place to another. There's one airport and it's a small country geographically. So I think those are the things that really have made it possible in addition to acquiring enough vaccine for really for everybody to get vaccinated you know, in short order. Big question here has been priority. Uh, and at the moment it appears the Department of Health and Human Services and the incoming Biden administration uh, may cast a wider net uh, rather than try to prioritize as as finally as the CDC had originally suggested. What's the policy in Israel? Is there a, is there a clear set of priorities as to who gets the vaccine first, second, third, fourth? The answer is yes. There's a very clear set of priori priorities. However, the as the vaccine has really been uh, uh, very uh, widely available, that's been less of an issue. I was noticing one of the American... Uh, priority lists and it's very, very uh, granular in the sense of who, who is, who's first and who's second. In Israel, essentially it was healthcare workers, people over the age of 60, and now we're already down to pretty much anybody over the age of 40 can get a vaccine at their local uh, health center. Uh, the, uh, the president of Israel, Ruvain Rivlin, likes to talk about the country's four tribes. That's his, that's his phrase, uh, national religious Israelis, secular Jews, Ultra Orthodox Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis. Uh, this is Arab Israelis within Israel, not in the West Bank and, and Gaza. Do all four groups seem to be getting vaccinated in equal numbers, or are there obvious differences between those groups? Well, no. The um, the short answer is no. Uh, and most specifically, the uh, Arab population in Israel has been somewhat uh, has been being vaccinated in somewhat lower percentages. This may. Uh, it may be facile, but it may be also somewhat true in the comparison that you were talking about earlier with the uh, African-American groups, some lack of trust um, or access. However, it mostly seems that this is being overcome and all the groups are getting, by and large, are getting vaccinated with a little bit of difference in the rates. Uh, we do see um, leaders from all the different communities publicly getting vaccinated and encouraging their their communities, uh, their sub-communities to get uh to get vaccinated. Uh, so there are differences, but it seems that 
the rising tide is floating all boats. Yeah. I, I'm curious. I was I was looking at the website of a, of a neighboring state uh, a few days ago, and a call for volunteers uh, to. Uh, help, uh, if, if, if not uh, help an actual vac vaccination, to direct traffic at the sites where people will come to get it. Who's doing it in Israel? Who, who, are, the, who are the people out there uh, who are the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the on-the-ground uh, workforce of the vaccination program? Well, the first people were the hospitals, including the Rabin Medical Center, um, really a, a, a true uh, uh, enrollment of the entire uh, population of the hospital. So we had our nurses and our physicians uh, taking over to make sure that our that our physician, we now have about 80% of our physicians have all been vaccinated. Some, most of which are beginning to get the second vaccine and so we full vaccination. Um, but it's really been a, the public health uh, service, the primary care pro uh, providers and nurses, um, people have been um, uh, taken from one area to another. People who are dealing with primary care of, of, of infants, been moved over to giving vaccinations. And so there's really been a general uh, kind of recruitment of, of uh, skilled people to do that. Dr. Mike Drescher uh, in Tel Aviv uh, of the Rabin Medical Center. Thanks for uh, being with us once again and hang around for the, for the Q&A that's coming. Uh, as we turn to our next guest, who is Dr. Ofer Levy, a professor of pediatrics at Harvard. He directs the Precision Vaccine Program at Boston Children's Hospital. And he also serves on the FDA's uh, Vaccine Advisory Committee and joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Levy, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank uh, you, Robert. And I should say, first of all, because since we we're just talking with Mike Drescher, uh, your parents live in Israel. Uh, can you confirm that things are going well there, that the, that the vaccination program seems to be effective? Yes, both my parents, Benjamin and Hannah Levy, live uh, in northern Israel in the Enhod artist community, and um, they're both in their 80s and reported to me that they've already received their second dose of vaccine in a very orderly way, uh, designated day and time, remaining in, in the car and, and, and getting immunized, just rolling down the window, showing their uh, national ID card, health card, and, and getting immunized in the car, and then pulling over for a 15-minute observation period to make sure there was no reaction, and they were on their way. And uh, that contrasted, uh, that smooth uh, approach contrasted very sharply with what's happening with my mother-in-law, Lucille, in Florida, in the U.S., where despite attention from both myself and my wife, Sharon, also a physician, uh, for eight days, we still uh, don't understand how to get her within a system towards immunization, setting aside the question of when she would even be immunized. So it's a very sharp contrast. Uh, like other panelists here today, you're a pediatrician. Uh, and uh, when we think of vaccinations, we think of children. Uh, when, when do we start seeing mass uh, vaccinations of, of children? Uh, thank you for that, Robert. Uh, first of all, um, let me say, you know, I served on, on the uh, Food and Drug Administration panel. It's called the Vaccines and Related Biologic Products Advisory Committee, or VRPAC, the Vaccine Advisory Panel, advising FDA on the emergency use authorization, for example, of the Pfizer product. Uh, FDA posed a question to the committee uh, to uh, vote in favor uh, of the EUA uh, for ages 16 years and up. Uh, there was a, a fair bit of discussion. You know, the, the committee eventually voted 17 to 4 in favor of the EUA. Uh, uh, but there was some dis discussion, some committee members uh, took a view that, well, uh, coronavirus doesn't hit children uh, as severely and uh, relatively fewer uh, teen par participants in the study. Therefore, uh, we shouldn't uh, have it down to 16 years of age, only 18. Uh, I, I took an opposite view. Uh, you know, if it's looking good in the 18 year olds, it's probably okay in the 16, 17 year olds. They're out there in the community. And I, I think this is a personal opinion now, not an FDA opinion. My personal opinion is uh, that if we look at the, at the global vaccine infrastructure, if you want to get a vaccine 80, 90% into a population to get herd immunity, uh, the way we do that typically is with pediatric vaccines. The, the, the bulk of the global vaccine infrastructure is designed to deliver vaccines to children. And, and it's my personal opinion that it's very important that there are now studies which are ongoing to determine the safety and efficacy efficacy uh, of these uh, coronavirus vaccines in, in younger children, uh, for example, 12 to, to 16 years old or 18 years old, and then eventually even younger than that. Um, you know, those studies, my understanding is, are underway, uh, have not seen any, any results yet from that. Uh, but if the safety and efficacy is there, uh, then I, I, for one, would, would, would be very supportive of, of that approach because I think that's going to be part of uh, the angle to get ourselves out of this mess. 
You you told me something about uh, serving on that committee that that uh, recommended made its recommendation to the FDA uh, that you decided to look at the mail that came in uh, in response to what you're doing cur- cur- uh, cur- and to to see what at least among people who are following the proceedings of the uh, of the FDA uh, what opinion is about about uh, the, the vaccines what did you learn from that. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. Um, So we've talked about some of our weaknesses uh, as a society in the United States in terms of public health and implementation, which is very true. Uh, We also have strengths in innovation. Of course, we point out to a company like Moderna, and it came out of nowhere and helped made a dent in this pandemic. But also, uh, we should feel good, in my opinion, about our FDA process. It was transparent. The briefing documents were made publicly available to the US public to download and look at the same data uh, I and the other committee members looked at. And uh, for several days preceding the meeting, uh, the website at the FDA is opened up for public commentary from everyday Americans, as of course those who are following it and are motivated to submit a a comment. Uh, But myself and and members of our Precision Vaccines Program team have now gone through nearly 1,000 public comments uh, for the Pfizer and Moderna processes and, and look at what's on people's mind. You have people who are pointing out, look, we're in the middle of a terrible pandemic. People are dying. We need a vaccine as soon as possible. So there was a lot of pro-vax sentiment. There were some people writing in and saying, look, uh, it's all good, but there are technical concerns. Are you moving too quickly? What's with safety, et cetera, those kind of uh, uh, approaches. And then uh, you have some people who uh, object to the whole enterprise of vaccines. And, and you know, Peter uh, Hotez has done so much around this and, and spoke to this earlier in, in our session today. Uh, there are some people who just don't, don't believe in, in immunization, don't believe uh, that the government should be telling people what to put in their bodies, et cetera, these kind of sentiments. And we saw a whole slew of that, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, submitted as well. I view it as very important to try to understand uh, these vaccine attitudes um, and to listen carefully. Uh, there, there, there is a range of opinion, right? It's not all or nothing. And some of it is vaccine hesitancy and not necessarily anti-vax per se, right? This is a, a nuanced and complex field. But I think uh, it's going to take careful listening and understanding uh, different segments of the population. The U.S. is a very complex uh, country with a lot of sub-communities. P- Peter uh, uh, alluded to that. And I think we're going to have to do listening and very effective communication. That's another area where we didn't get a good score, in my opinion, is it seems like vaccines were rolling out in trucks and somebody said, oh yeah, right, aren't we supposed to have a public messaging about this? So I think the public messaging is key and it's going to have to target uh, various different uh, communities. Uh, You know, we're very sophisticated in the U.S. in marketing stuff we want to sell people. Uh, Hopefully we can start leveraging that degree of sophistication in in, in spreading the word about the importance of these vaccines. I I just wanted to ask one more point. As, As Peter Hotez described, to us in recent years, the uh, the the uh, opposition to vaccination has merged with the "don't tread on me" idea. You know that the I guess the yeah. serpent has a certain yeah. Uh, yeah. S- serves different purposes there. Um, did you did you feel any any greater understanding or feel any more confident that you could win an argument about vaccination with the anti-vaxxers whom you read after after looking at the mail, or were you frustrated by the uh, the, the great differences between between groups? I, I suspected. You know, I've served on on that committee. Uh, for uh, four years beforehand. Uh, And there's also, in addition to the public commentary through the website, we used to meet in person, of course, and there was an hour uh, set aside, even at at this virtual meeting, for public commentary. So I'm familiar uh, with the range of opinions, so it didn't surprise me. Um, But I did uh, look at it and say, boy, uh, we better get our act together in terms of messaging and engaging in a respectful way. Now, there are going to be some people that, that are, you know, no matter how, uh, 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 you know, clever or, or, or thoughtful we try to be in engaging them, it's going to go nowhere. And I, I'm sure Peter would endorse that. But but there are a, a chunk of people who, you know, especially if we can get that to that transparency about the surveillance around vaccine safety. It's not that we just authorize these things that get injected into people, we turn our back. There is ongoing surveillance. Uh, I received my second dose of the Pfizer product uh, uh, earlier uh, this week. I, I opted into an app on my iPhone called VSafe, Vaccine Safe. I fill out a daily survey. Have I had side effects, uh, pain in the arm, a headache, or whatever it is, and I report whatever I've had. Uh, so it's important that as you know, physicians, we practice what
what we preach and that there's a transparent process. We communicate any safety concerns, identify them. Uh, that can help, uh, but it's got to be coupled with a serious engagement and targeting of messaging. Uh, Dr. Ofer Levy, thank you so much. And we'll uh, come back to you momentarily. But first, our next guest uh, is not an MD. Uh, Professor Jason Schwartz uh, teaches health policy at the Yale School of Public Health, uh, and he's joining us uh, from New Haven to talk about questions of efficiency and efficacy and equity uh, in distributing COVID vaccines. Uh, welcome to our panel, and thank you for taking part in this event today. Great to be with you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, first, as an event in the history of public health, uh, how does the challenge of vaccinating the public against COVID uh, rate in size and complexity? Oh my, it seems like there's probably not a, a playbook or a precedent that we can draw from for thinking about what we've been through and, and what we're about to continue to expand in with respect to the vaccination program. We have examples, obviously, of great pandemics, 1918 is the one that we think about that was as disruptive to our society, to our economy, to our communities. And we have mass vaccination efforts that have been implemented in various places at various times, polio in the 1950s and, and some influenza pandemics that were um, causes for great concern initially, but vaccination programs that turned out to be uh, underwhelming in various ways in the intervening years. But when we put that together, do we, th we think about where we've been and what we're in the midst of right now, the, the challenges ahead, so many of which you've heard about, um, we really are writing the playbook in real time and, and, and the challenges just keep cascading as we get deeper into this program. You know, I've been thinking back to one of the issues of the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was medical records. Um, are, are, we, uh, are we equipped in the software department to handle this? That is, uh, can we tell 100 million Americans uh, the, the reminder that you have your second shot coming up within the next uh, month? Or, and the description we just heard uh, from, uh, from Dr. Levy, is that a typical American's uh, facility with, with a smartphone and the internet? Or is it uh, uh, going to leave a lot of people out? I was thinking when I heard the example of one of the reasons why the, the program in Israel seems to be going so well in that integration of the healthcare system and the healthcare infrastructure, and you couldn't have a different story here in the United States. I, I teach an introduction to health policy for our public health students, and the whole semester is basically unpacking the very fragmented ways in which our healthcare, sister, healthcare system in the United States is cobbled together, how various populations access care and how it's paid for and, and how it's communicated, and of course, all of those folks that are that are left out of our healthcare system. So we begin with this fragmented uh, way of organizing and delivering healthcare, a, a public health system that has been underfunded and under-resourced for decades. And now we're trying to piece together what and by all accounts is really a fragmented rollout of the vaccination program where different states, in some cases, different counties and different cities are all trying to implement this task uh, that, is, that is so challenging. So we, we do find ourselves with sort of one arm tied behind our back mm -hmm. to begin with because of our healthcare system, let alone the new challenges this vaccination program creates. Is there a, is there a, a, a history uh, uh, to the whole issue of establishing priorities? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of torn between the idea of whether, uh, I mean, I can, I can, I can wait. I think I, I, now I have the immunity that comes from having had COVID-19, which is, should carry me, I guess, a couple of months. Uh, but I, I'm torn between the idea of uh, being part of group 1C or feeling, what are you, what are you bothering with this for? Just, uh, we're all made safer by another, the first 40 million people getting vaccines, whoever they are. Yes, and by the way, I'm glad that your case seems to be mild by all accounts. Yes. Fingers yeah. crossed that that uh, continues. I, I think that's right. We have this balancing act right now that we're thinking about with respect to this prioritization framework. We know, as we've heard, that we're are going to have vaccine doses in limited supply for some time, as much as we try to increase that supply, as much as we try to fix the issues that keep us from using all of our available supply as efficiently and as quickly as we need to. And those are things that need to be addressed. But in the meantime, we're going to have millions more Americans who are waiting for vaccines, eager for vaccines, eligible for, for vaccines than we can deliver in any given week. And you're hearing in the media, you're hearing elsewhere, the question about how these prioritization frameworks balance the understandable public health and ethical urgency of trying to use the vaccines we have and can administer in ways that do the most good, that, that are directed towards the populations at greatest risk and highest need versus the concern that relying too, of uh, being too fastidious about their, their adherence might unnecessarily slow down the vaccination program. So we're right now hearing this in real time, this debate about the role of the prioritization systems as the right way to 
uh, ration the scarce resource versus that other compelling interest that we know that the, the more we can introduce vaccines, the faster we can introduce vaccines. Uh, every dose of the vaccine administered is a win, as one former FDA commissioner likes to say. It's a balancing act. And I don't sure, I'm not sure we have it right. Different states are trying to thread that needle in different ways, but I think that's an issue we'll continue to see refined in the months ahead. I should tell everyone that in a moment we'll be taking your questions, which you can enter using the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but I, uh, before leaving this conversation, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Professor Schwartz, you, you, you're on the committee that advises the governor of Connecticut. As you say, different states are, are, are doing things differently. Do you get the sense that things are better, that there's some feedback mechanism here when things go wrong, that uh, at least in Connecticut, they, they take on board the problems and do something better? States are learning. We're now, what, five weeks into this vaccination program. Clearly, the performance is variable across states. Connecticut, I'm proud to say, is, is doing quite well in, in, the, in the rankings, if we want to think of it that way. But, but that's a reminder that we're just getting underway and that there's very hard work uh, still to be done. We're now moving from what might be the easiest stage of the vaccination rollout, of focusing on our healthcare workers and our long-term care facilities, uh, to a now this phase 1B, which is ever expanding, as we've heard about, which reaches a much more um, a large and scattered population of older individuals, high risk individuals, individuals in states like Connecticut that are identified based on their uh, essential work they perform. So the, the challenges are now cascading. We're reaching a new chapter where we need to now think about rapid expansion of not just the vaccination infrastructure, but the communications, the outreach, the engagement with communities to help them um, identify where and when and how they can get a vaccine. So there's a lot of learning happening. Uh, I think there will be changes afoot with the, the arrival of the Biden administration, um, but and it's not a moment too soon because clearly we are in a situation where these vaccines are urgently needed. The pandemic is raging. Uh, and there's and there's difficult times ahead, but the vaccine does provide uh, a reason for hope, despite despite all of these challenges we're we're encountering right now with them. Okay, let's hear from that. That, by the way, is Professor Jason uh, Jason Schwartz of uh, the Yale School of Public Health. He's in New Haven, uh, and we'd like to hear from you right now and put questions to all of our guests, Dr. Levy and Dr. Hotez and Dr. Redlander have rejoined us, as has Mike Drescher. Uh, a basic question, whoever wants to take it, uh, does the vaccine prevent outright infection of coronavirus or reduce the severity of the infection or does it do both? I guess we're talking about the uh, two messenger RNA uh, uh, vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer that are in the US. Uh, who would like to uh, tell us what the vaccine, Dr. Dr. Levy? Yeah, I, I could just say that what we know about the um, Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines is that uh, they're safe and uh, they're, they have very high efficacy, about 94, 95% against COVID, against the disease. But infection does not equal disease. Uh, infection is a prerequisite. You know, you get the virus in your nose, your throat, and your upper airway, and that's a first step towards disease, but not everybody shows disease. And as we know with this virus, one can be asymptomatic walking around with the virus shedding and not know it, which is why it's so important to wear our mask, keep our distance, even if we're feeling fine. Robert, I'll just, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just jump in and say that there's some real uh, kind of maybe breaking news on this front from Israel. Um, just yesterday, the Ministry of Health came out on the basis of data from one of the, the, the largest HMO, from the Clalit HMO, which is beginning to show not only a decrease in uh, disease from the vaccine, but actually a decrease in transmissibility. And so, um, and this is based on quite a large amount of data that's been gathered. It's one of the reasons that Pfizer has been so eager to provide Israel with enough vaccine is that Israel has been um, willing to provide Pfizer back with uh, data on the population. Should I just assume that somebody who uh, uh, uses a very pricey concierge practice uh, is going to have an easier time getting a vaccine than, uh, than, than I might or someone else might, or, or am I being too cynical? Um, you know, we heard some stories immediately with respect to in New York, where there were, were some some questions about that. Uh, I think it's depending on how uh, well the states really do adhere to where they're shipping their doses. Um, as the rollout happens and the pace of which it happens, will we hear these these isolated stories of folks working favors and getting special treatment or um, inside access? I think I think it will, given just the magnitude of what we're thinking about. I hope that those are 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 outlier. Those are are. are marginal cases rather than things that we see but but can we eliminate them no i don't think that's that's realistic so um we just had a really rough 
situation in New York because the governor and the mayor were clearly not on the same page. Mm -hmm. And they aired these differences publicly, which which was pretty disheartening. I ended up speaking about a week and a half ago to individually separately, both the mayor and the governor about this. But um, and this is one of the problems with it, with a kind of a really, uh, really inadequate guidance coming from the federal government. Yes, the CDC had the guidelines for priority setting, but a lot was left to the states and the governor insisted on really sticking with the healthcare workers first until everybody was vaccinated before moving on to the other priority categories. And the mayor uh, was opposed to that. Uh, they finally worked it out, but it, it's been painful, but it's also emblematic of what happens when you don't have clear leadership yeah. um, and messages that are not credible coming from the federal government. Uh, Donald Trump managed to you know, really undermine the credibility of not only just the White House, but the federal agencies that are so critical here. And I think that that's going to be a lingering problem that's going to need to be addressed. But right now, there's confusion. It's getting ironed out slowly, but surely, I guess. But it's one of the factors that's delaying our ability to rapidly get whole population uh, vaccinated. This is a question from Vivian Prusak. Uh, she says to all, uh, all of you, whoever wants to answer, why is there a supply backlog? Uh, if Moderna does not require such cold storage or quite such cold storage as, as Pfizer, uh, why don't we prioritize Moderna over Pfizer? Uh, she uh, says we are both over 65 years old and we cannot get an appointment until June of uh, 2021. Dr. Levy, we haven't Heard from heard from you recently. Uh, yeah. Why is there is there a supply backlog, or or is there simply a, 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 a bad inefficient system of delivering it? Well, you know, listen. All of this again, context. If you look at vaccines across world history, they typically took ten to twenty years uh, from from conception to to getting them in, into people at any scale. Uh, this has now been done. In months, uh, so this is a historic milestone. Uh, but it's 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 both uh, production. Uh, scaling, just because you have a vaccine that's safe and effective that you can make in thousands or tens of thousands of doses, it's not the same thing to have to produce uh, millions or billions of doses. So that, that's really uh, a scaling question. Uh, and then uh, once once you have the product, it has to get to certain locations that have the right kind of freezer systems, Pfizer, negative 80. Those are expensive freezer systems. I know because I, I run a research lab, I got to pay for them. Um, uh, and, and those usually just found in, in, in biomedical centers uh, or the Moderna product at negative 20, which is more like the temperature in, in your household freezer. Um, and then beyond that, it has to get into people's arms. So there are challenges at every one of those steps. Uh, I'm not privy to all the day-to-day -day information of how many vials are where right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line is, uh, you, 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 I would take whatever vaccine you qualify for. Uh, both the Pfizer and Moderna products are safe, effective. They, they look to be similar in those characteristics and um, whatever is available. And uh, I, I know that, that, that those, those sponsors, those companies are, are trying to produce as quickly as they can, um, but the, the challenge remains to do this all so quickly at such a large scale. You know, it's, it's also worth pointing out that this is a relatively new technology. Um, it is a brand new technology. We've, they've never scaled it up before. You know, the intention for Operation Warp Speed was never to make the mRNA vaccines the workhorse. They, they mm -hmm. were going to be the first out of the starting gate because you can make a piece of mRNA quickly. But, you know, it's, it's still an immature technology in terms of scale up production. And that's why it's not going to be really have any impact, uh, I don't think, on low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. So the idea was these would be the beginning and then the adenovirus, the Novavax vaccine, some of the others, maybe ours would be the workhorses the, uh, to move that along. And that's where we have to put a lot of emphasis now is bringing up the other vaccines. Absolutely. And we have to understand that this is a global problem that requires a global response. These viruses don't recognize national borders or anything like that. So there's going to be a need for multilateralism, multiple types of vaccines, including those that are practical to deliver globally. Uh, this is a question, uh, perhaps uh, this may be first for Dr. Hotez. Have any genetic markers been identified that might point to which patients will be more severely affected by this uh, coronavirus? Well, there is some uh, work done out of Rockefeller University by a group headed by Jean-Laurent Casanova is his name. And he's, um, their group has shown that there are um, some genetic susceptibilities to 
COVID-19 and they have to do with uh, defects and the ability to produce interferon. Um, and this is actually the, um, the work of Ofer Levy. He's created a whole center around identifying host res- specific host responses to specific vaccines. In other words, there's a way to fine tune this and mm-hmm. maybe he wants to say something. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the shout out. Um, In 2015, Boston Children's Hospital, which is my home institution, created a program called the Precision Vaccines Program, which I direct. And it basically is bringing precision medicine to vaccinology. The concept that vaccines may not be one size fits all. You cannot assume that a vaccine that works well in a healthy middle-aged individual will work identically when somebody's 90 years old or when somebody is an infant, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we are modeling the human immune system outside the body with blood donors donations. And even throughout the pandemic, we've had elderly individuals uh, from our hospital, elderly individuals from our community, from my local synagogue, Eitz Chaim, come down, bike down to to, to the hospital, donate blood for our research as we scan for adjuvants, molecules that can boost an immune response uh, in older individuals um, uh, so that we can build, hopefully, uh, single shot uh, coronavirus vaccines, uh, etc. Why aren't the panelists giving the Trump administration credit uh, for pushing for the vaccine? vaccines to be developed so quickly. Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a myth perpetrated by uh, Trump and Trump supporters. Uh, the fact is that the credit goes to the scientists and the pharmaceutical companies. They were actually working on uh, developing these uh, vaccines, as Peter was saying, for many years, really since the first SARS uh, outbreak in uh, you know 2003. Uh, Trump articulated a desire to get the vaccine developed and, you know, good for him. Uh, but that hardly outweighs the extraordinary incompetence of, for which every other aspect of this was managed from, from really under, uh, you know, uh, missteps in creating testing uh, to credible messages to putting out, you know, real BS about, uh, you know, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine or uh, using bleach. I mean, this is an administration that has been dishonest, non-transparent, and incompetent. So yes, he did articulate Operation Warp Speed, and I'm glad he did. But a lot of us in the field, let's say myself only, then I don't want to speak for the field, but feel like there was such unmitigated failure uh, on the Trump administration's shoulders for not getting this under control much sooner. Well, here's a uh, here's a, an, an apt question then to, uh, to conclude with. Uh, Joe Biden says he wants to immunize 100 million people in his first 100 days, do we have the supply required and the public health system prepared to accomplish this? Peter Hotez, why don't you start? Um, and, and first of all, I think it's really important he set that ambitious goal. You know, one of the things that we we haven't done is we stop being a country that's willing to do hard things. And, and we have to be willing to do hard things. This is all we have left. So we're going to do it. We have no other choice. Uh, it's going to be daunting. We don't have the infrastructure yet to vaccinate the American people at that scale. Um, we've got to streamline some of the guidelines and we have to get more vaccines up. Um, so if you ask me today, do we have it all in place? Absolutely not. But this is going to have to be um, the number one priority for the administration and really the number one priority for every elected leader. And, and you know, I've now calling on every public official every elected leader across the country to be able to articulate what they're doing to vaccinate the American people, because otherwise we are the, the default is unimaginable. Jason Schwartz, if we took Connecticut's share of those hundred million, I, I don't know what percent of the U S population lives in Connecticut, 10%, I don't know, 6 million people. I don't know how many people are there. Uh, is it, um, is it feasible in Connecticut? Do you think to, uh, we're about, we're about 1% of the population, three and a half million out of the 330 million. So we're a nice, even 1%. I think, I think our, our fraction of that, I think we can, uh, we can get there. I agree with, with Pete, Dr. Hotez. There are so many challenges ahead of, for any state and for the country, it's going to require a real, reset a real uh, resolve and focus and, and frankly a level of federal coordination federal investment to support Connecticut to support every state to a greater level than what we've seen so far but I think uh, it's it's a not just a, a, a aspirational goal but it's an achievable one but but the, the clock is already ticking to get and, us and let, let's not forget that this is not just operations shipping vaccines to freezers it's getting them into arms and that's going to also involve 
messaging, engaging communities in earnest conversation around safety, all of that work will need to be done. Well, Dr. Ofer Levy and uh, Professor Jason, uh, Jason Schwartz, Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Erwin Redliner, and uh, Michael Drescher, uh, thanks to all of you for taking part in this uh, discussion about uh, what we uh, what we hope will be at least as much the year of the vaccine as the year of the of, of the virus in 2021. Thanks to all of you. And uh, Thank you. many thanks to Joshua Plout and uh, Nate Banzani and Ronnie Gibigliano, uh, all of the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center and our video and Zoom director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, also thanks to our sponsor, which is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization representing uh, in the United States, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in uh, greater Tel Aviv. The website, by the way, for the hospital is www.afrmc.org. Join us next month for Addressing Racial Inequality, a panel with special guests. I'm Robert Siegel, uh, and this has been Global Connections, Navigating the New Abnormal. See you next month. Stay safe and stay healthy. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.